Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, folks, well, it's uh, a pleasure to have with us um, Dr. John uh, Bowers from RICO Innovations. He directs the California Research Center for RICO. And uh, John I had a, 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 a short, a, a, a former life at MIT as a mechanical engineering student. After graduation, he uh, joined Merle and also MIT as, as a lecturer and uh, stayed there for a while. And then uh, later he moved to uh, Rico's. In, in the process, he also started a couple of companies with an interesting pass. But I'll let him say more about him in the talk. Okay, John, thank thanks you. for joining Thanks very much, and thanks for inviting me to come today. So um, feel free to interrupt and ask questions. Anything is fine. I have um, a quick overview of our lab that I'd like to show you. I'll give you a very brief introduction to who I am, my background, maybe a little bit more than Rico already said. And then just a number of demos of things we're working on at Rico Innovations. So please feel free to interrupt or ask questions or anything you'd like to do. Um, so I, uh, as um, uh, Rico mentioned, I was at MIT uh, a few years ago. I guess you don't need this much detail, but uh, I was a mechanical engineer and I worked at um, Hughes Aircraft as a mechanical engineer and then at Polaroid Corporation working on some new printers. And then I did a startup called Stylus Innovation and uh, went to work for Mitsubishi Electric Research Lab. So it's had kind of a mix of different things, startups, research labs, and uh, regular um, industrial experience. And, uh, and then I've been at um, Rico Innovations since uh, 1999, so almost nine years there. But uh, so I like having kind of a, a variety of experience because it gives you a chance to look at things from a different perspective. And uh, in, at uh, Mitsubishi Electric Research Labs, they did a lot with 3D graphics. So, you know, it's kind of fun to see some famous people. I know Michael Cohen's name from, uh, you know, many years ago. <laughs> so I never met you, though. But I've seen you at SIGGRAPH a few times or something. I don't know. You're in graphics. Yeah, I've been in there for many years. So, I mean, anyway, so uh, uh, where's Rico Innovations? Um, basically, Rico Innovations is a wholly owned subsidiary of um, Rico Company Limited in Japan. So we're owned and operated in the U.S. and we're only in Northern California. We have two offices, one in uh, Cupertino, where about uh, 10 or 12 people work down in Cupertino, another one up in Menlo Park, if any of you know uh, that area. So most of the research, uh, the technical research is in the Menlo Park office, and we do customer research in Cupertino. And uh, anyways, you're welcome to come down and visit sometime. We'll give you a quick tour. and. Uh, uh, thanks for your hospitality here. We have uh, our organization uh, changed recently. Uh, our president now is from Japan. He's the CTO of Rico Company Limited, which is very interesting because a lot of re responsibility there and sees an interesting picture of the whole company. And so he comes out about once a month. He's, he's not, um, uh, they don't tell us what to do. You know, uh, one nice thing about Rico is the ideas come from the researchers mostly, unless there's an area they're interested in having us explore that will ask us to do some specific exploration. But almost all of our research is based on trends that we see in Silicon Valley or that we think are going to be interesting. And uh, we have, uh, um, I work in, we have several groups. And I'll, I'll describe these groups briefly, but I'm in charge of the California Research Center. There's 21 researchers there right now. We have five summer students, sometimes as many as eight or nine in the summer, not nearly the 300 that you enjoy here. Um, the Advanced Business Center, the one down in Cupertino, is focused on it working with RICO customers, either current or potential future RICO customers, uh, kind of a co-invention situation where we have technologies, or we have ideas of things we think they would find valuable. We find a site and work with those people very closely to understand what their needs are and see if we can provide solutions for them and then eventually turn those customer needs into products that Rico can sell. So, um, and then of course we uh, try to transfer, this, this is more of a marketing and business development, not so much technical development because they'll use whatever technology is available. Uh, there's another group called the Community Network Services run by Greg Wolf. And it's a different um, approach. He looks for opportunities to uh, differentiate RICO or provide innovative service 
to uh, current and potential customers. And I wanted to give one quick example of CNS results. So they found that if you, uh, one example I use is that if you go to a school system, you know, the kids that are enrolled in school also have to go through to a clinic to receive their immunizations before they're allowed to um, go to school. And so you, everybody always takes their immunization piece of paper with all the, you know, everything signed and stamped and hands it to the school. And then they, I don't know if they make a copy of it and file it somewhere or whatever, but they don't have an electronic copy. They might at most have a scanned copy of it, but they don't have the original electronic data. And one of the reasons is it's so difficult to enter to um, bring uh, systems together where, uh, you know, uh, the clinic will have one information system set up. If they have one at all, it'll, it'll probably be a different one than the school has set up. And so uh, one thing we've developed at uh, CNS is a way of encrypting and sharing records using uh, barcodes. Um, so a barcode like this on a document has both the document identifier and an encryption key so that you can download you can create a document in one place and put that up in the web, maybe at S3 or somewhere. It's completely encrypted, so even if people find it, they can't do anything with it. And when you get to the school, you can hold up your sheet of paper with the barcode on it to their webcam. It brings the document in, decrypts it, and now they have the original data, or at least an image of the document, rather than having to scan it themselves. So it makes the workflow of that system much easier, and it integrates the systems in a way that wasn't possible before. So that's one type of activity we'll do with community network services. I'll talk a little bit more about the California Research Center activities now. Uh, as I mentioned, we have, well, we have 21 researchers now. We just hired someone uh, this week. And uh, it was founded almost 20 years ago. Actually, that should be 1989. I'll fix that slide. And our uh, mission is to create new technology or innovative technology and intellectual property that RICO can use in products. So historically, we've done a number of things. I think the thing that our CRC is most well known for historically is image processing. We've done, um, uh, we helped develop the JPEG 2000 um, uh, pr uh, standard. Uh, it was based on some wavelet work that we did at uh, CRC many years ago. And we um, developed a very high speed uh, JPEG algorithm. I think it was an integer algorithm instead of a floating point. That means that uh, we were able to put on an ASIC and and have a low power uh, chip that we could put in digital cameras. So the first Ricoh digital camera had a JPEG ASIC that was very fast at compressing images. In. So, uh, but we also do uh, many different types of research. I'm gonna talk about this optics and image processing optimization. I have an example of some user experience research we've been doing. Uh, I mentioned the electronic paper fusion, the shared record system that CNS is using that came out of CRC. And then we do some document workflow work and also work on document devices. We have one group called the Device, Inter Device Integration Research Group. And uh, we're looking at ways of creating uh, documents, kind of like the Zune works so well for music. Can we come up with a device that works well for documents instead of audio? So um, the research groups, we have uh, six research groups right now, although this is really a single individual. Uh, Jonathan Hole is doing the multimedia document analysis and works with multimedia, like he, uh, they developed a meeting recording system that then puts the meetings up on the web, makes it available to other people, and they uh, work on a variety of different uh, techniques for user interfaces. The shared media group uh, is where the shared records technology was developed, so looking at different ways of exchanging media, even in paper form or electronically. Uh, the device integration research works on these document devices I mentioned before. Uh, David Stork works on a variety of things, but one thing he's been doing is developing new research themes, looking for new research or uh, new pillars for RICO, uh, areas where we can apply our uh, intellect and skills to develop a new technology that can be part of the, the larger company. And uh, the one thing that he worked on was something called Joypo several years ago that now we formed a new group called the Digital Optics Research that integrates optics and image processing uh, optimization. And then this is also brand new, RI Labs, and I'll mention some more about that. Uh, it's a way of getting our technology similar. Microsoft has a similar site where you can try out uh, research like the Photosynth project. So we'd like to get some of our technology out in people's hands so we can play with that. And the first project is called iCandy, and I'll give a demo of that today as well. So let me uh, talk about Joypo briefly. Um, the traditional way for doing um, 
image, process, image optimization on, in an electronic system is to do your best to optimize the optics to get the best quality image you can on the sensor. And once you've got the optics designed, then you do image processing to improve the image as much as you can. But the, um, the problem with that is there's some limitations uh, to doing optimization that way, and I'll talk about that. Uh, if you include both the image optim uh, the optical optimization and the image processing simultaneously, there are some benefits you can get from that. And what you're really doing is relaxing the requirement of the uh, quality of the image on the sensor. It turns out that's not as important as you think, unless you don't want to do any image processing after. But of course, these sensors don't spit out JPEG images, they spit out raw images. So you have to do something anyways, you might as well do a little bit of extra work. So in the old design method, you get out an image, you do some image processing, and then save it and pass it around. So I'm saying the same thing again here. Now, in this case, you might have a more blurry image or something that looks to your eye like not as good of an image. And uh, let's see. So I don't know if you're familiar with CDM optics. They've been doing this for a few years, something similar, as they have this uh, cubic phase plate that they'll insert in the middle of optics, uh, right at the place where the image focuses and then comes back out. And what that does by inserting this wavefront lens is that it distorts the image in a known way. And specifically what they do at CDM optics is they distort the image so that no matter how far away your focus is, you know, how far away the object is that you're taking the picture of, it has the similar distortion in the image sensor. So then, since you have known distortion, you can then image process that to get a high quality image with a greater depth of field, which is wonderful for things like microscopy, where you have very short depth of field. The typical approach is to take many pictures and change the focus and then combine them all together. With this, you get a much larger depth of field, and so you have fewer pictures you have to take in order to improve that. So um, uh, basically, when you're optimizing optics, is you're minimizing the point spread function across the entire scene for a given uh, in, you know, um, object distance. And uh, by inserting this uh, special phase plate, they're able to um, not worry about the point spread function, but worry about what they can get out of the image after they've captured it. And uh, if you look at, um, you know, a lot of times they look at um, the modulation transfer function, the optical transfer function of an image I mean, of a, of a set of lenses and say, you know, this has a certain quality. So here's the spatial frequency. And, you know, of course it goes down. Eventually, you, you know, you hit the diffraction limit where you can't see any additional information. But it turns out if you focus the, uh, sharply, if you focus sharply on an object, then you have a number of zeros here in the MTF. And those zeros mean lost information. So in fact, focusing sharply is the wrong thing to do if you want to get more information out. Whereas, uh, you know, not, a lot of these other things don't have zero, so you don't lose as much information if they're... Um... So let me tell you what this slide is, actually. It's, um, it's uh, if you simulate an optical system and for um, you include now a certain amount of defocus or sphere collaboration or coma in order to um, have a root mean squared error that's the same for each of these systems taken individually, then this is what the modulation transfer function looks like. So you can see uh, the defocus really throws away a lot of information by the time the um, root mean square error gets to be the same as just having a little bit of coma or a little bit of spherical aberration. So anyways, to give you an example, a visual example, so you can see what's going on, this is the CDW example here. Image from a traditional lens is uh, defocused around here, but if you put the, um, the CDW uh, wave plate inside the optics in, it's all blurry, and then after image processing, it appears uh, crisp. So um, with a traditional scanner, for instance, designed a normal way, you might put together uh, a lens and have uh, this result, and then do some image processing, but still end up with this result. So. Uh, with Joypo, uh, the image that you capture might not look as good, but uh, after image processing, you get a lot more detail in the whole system. And the, 
with a traditional uh, setup, you probably also have to uh, stop it down a little bit in order to actually get this information. Add more light. So you get a much, whoops, sorry. So you get a much higher quality, but at the expense of, you know, it's a, a more expensive uh, optical system and you need to provide a lot more light. With Joypo, you can get almost the same thing that way. Another type of device that works with, uh, with Joypo principles is designing a lenslet array right on top of an imaging sensor. So instead of um, having a big lens sticking out front, you're willing to do more image processing, super resolution work to get a high quality image. Uh, so if you're imaging an A, you get a bunch of little A's, then you can put those all together using some kind of image processing. So using Joypo, you can get, uh, you have more freedom in uh, designing the form factor of the device. It doesn't have to be, be a big set of lenses. And you can even create new classes of devices that were not, were not possible before. But one of the nice things is, is you can improve image quality so much, you can go two directions. You can either do something that's cheaper by, uh, you know, in some cases, maybe leaving out a lens or two in a seven lens system, you might be able to re reduce it down to four lenses instead. And so again, even though it looks like a worse image, by the time you've done image processing, it's the same quality as you would have gotten before. So obviously you can provide cheaper products that way or it's easier to manufacture. And then the other option is to keep the same expense and the same complexity but have much higher quality images. So um, we're working on a theoretical framework to optimize optics and image processing simultaneously and developing software to make that easier for people to do. And then of course, you know, trying to make, uh, achieve these goals. So we, you could imagine making a very thin high resolution camera because we're you know, doing the super resolution trick on the image when it comes in. We're not, I'm not gonna say whether we're doing that or not, but that's an example of something you could work on. So that's, that's a Joypo overview. If anyone has any questions, uh, I'm gonna move on to another demo. Otherwise, yeah. Is it admission to do a processing on the device itself or is it as a post-processing uh, somewhere else? Well, it doesn't necessarily happen on the sensor. I mean, right now we do image processing separately, but of course you can integrate as much as you want. Uh, it's easy to develop, an, for the types of image processing we're doing, it's easy to develop an ASIC or an FPGA that'll do that. So we could, you know, if we could put that into a sensor, that's fine, but often those are separate chips. I think every camera manufacturer has uh, their own special, like Kodak has a special processing chip and Canon, you know, they put in their cameras, they even advertise it on their box that, you know, uses this kind of image processing, you know, to get the sharpest picture. And so it's kind of that same type of processing you would do, not just turning it from a raw image into a JPEG, but actually going from the raw image to, you know, whatever optimization, I mean, whatever image processing you have to do to get the image correct, sharpen it up. Do you guys look at any of the sort of flutter, shutter, encoded aperture stuff? Or it's I've seen that. Optics? I don't think, like the uh, Mitsubishi Electric Research Lab, the work they did there, yeah, I've seen that, but we, I don't think we're doing anything in particular on that. We have about four people working on this right now. So we're more focused on the um, developing the tools than, um, and so you can imagine there's, you know, 10 to 100 different ways of optimizing it. Yeah, so we're kind of focused on the basic ones right now. That's a nice, uh, it's pretty interesting application though, where they took a bunch of staggered photos and they reassemble it. So even things that, get more things that move or. Yeah, so you can see them from moving things. Or yeah. Coded apertures, sort of the right. same things. Yeah. Right, right. In fact, that's really popular in astronomy now, right? I don't know if that's where the idea came from, but I read an article maybe six months ago that they're, they just snap a whole bunch of pictures and then the quality is so much better when they combine them. Okay. All right, this, this next one is called GeoFind. It's kind of a fun idea, just a little thing, but it's kind of interesting also. So, you know, GPS probably doesn't work here. I don't know, I don't have a GPS device with me, but it probably doesn't work in this room because the satellite signals are fairly weak. They don't come through. They're getting better. But uh, you, know, you have systems like Loki. I don't know if you're familiar with Loki. They, they basically drive around with a GPS device and listen to all the Wi-Fi access points they can hear. And they then do kind of an estimate of where you are based on the ones you can hear. So that's a pretty good resolution, maybe just like, like uh, GPS. Our office isn't in any place where they've driven by, even though you know, we're somewhat set off from the road. So Loki doesn't work. Loki's built into the iPhone and it doesn't work. For us, they use cell, power, cell tower triangulation on the iPhone for me in my office because 
the low key stuff doesn't work. So it says you're somewhere within these five football fields of radius, you know. But if I go to a low key site, then um, uh, it, it tells me much more accurately where I am. So they drive around. Uh, you might not be on their map. You may not have an internet connection or have downloaded the right map. So that's one of the disadvantages. Uh, ECHAO has a system also where you can map internally to your own uh, company so that you just walk around with your, you know, you mark on a map where you are and it says, okay, I can hear these access points. So it figures out. I think it has a pretty good resolution and they have a whole system. You do have to be on the network because it talks to their server. Their server runs the algorithm to calculate where you are and tells you where you are. So, well, what, you know, are there any other alternatives? Well, one day I was uh, in a car going down the street and I had my iPhone out. I don't think I was driving. And uh, I noticed these things popping up. You know, do you want to, you know, I finally turned it off because you keep, you want to connect to this, you want to connect to that. And no, I don't want to, I'm just trying to use my phone. You know, these Wi-Fi access points. And I thought, well, if we could encode latitude and longitude coordinates in uh, Wi-Fi access points, then that'd be an easy way for people to let themselves know where they are uh, using Wi-Fi, not using any GPS or anything. And so um, we've set up a system where you can modify, of course, anyone can modify their own SSIDs. And uh, we've created a, um, uh, an encoding that is small enough to fit easily inside of uh, pretty much, you know, SSIDs can have up to 32 characters, but the types of characters they can use are limited. So we have a nine digit code like is shown up here. And in fact, that's running on this access point that I plugged in right here. So I can use GeoFi here now, even though, even if I didn't have a network um, access point, I mean access, yeah. But it's more cooperative. It's like not without the board driving, basically. Yeah, and Loki is very similar to um, what? What was it called? No, no, Place. Just like yeah. so. In this case, actually, the owners of the access points provide that as a service. Is that right. The right. Yeah. So let me give you a, a quick demo on this. Uh, let's see if I can. So, for instance, uh, I can just ask where I am. It's going to come up the same because it's just listening to this access point. And I, I don't have, all I have is Wi-Fi here. And if I wasn't connected to the network, it wouldn't matter because I can just listen to what's being broadcast. And as you probably know, Wi-Fi broadcasts SSIDs 10 times, 9.8 times a second. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit of uh, garbage to be broadcasting lots of extra things. But on the other hand, I can set one up at home and one up at work. And then I always know where I am. So now if I want to do a live search maps, say where am I? Then it pops up. Oh, I was already there. But anyway, so I, I tested it out before to see if it worked. So here I am. I'm in the old building in this case because the satellite data is old. But, you know, so it's easy. And so one thing you can do with this is if you have a camera with Wi-Fi, then you can be listening. And when you take a picture, you can put lat long coordinates in the EXIF data. And then it shows up on your map, you know, in whatever uh, photo site you're using. And, uh, you know, when I save a file, if I hear a GFI access point around, I can just say, okay, this is where I was when I was editing. If I send an email, I can send a little GeoFi tag that says where I am, uh, you know, when I sent the email. And then um, also on my business card, I have a little GeoFi code that has the GeoFi address of my office. So if you type that into our website, our GeoFi.net website, it'll take you right to my office and show you where it is. Then you can say, you know, I want directions to there, you know, from where I am or whatever. Did you have a question? This is a super intriguing idea. I'm yeah. just thinking, what you need now is this viral element that makes. Yeah. yeah. I go yeah. to my friends and say, well, you yeah. need to do that too, so I can navigate better, right? Right, right. Well, that's the thing in your neighborhood. Yeah, you, should, you just want to walk around, or you want to. So there, here's some ideas for that. So first of all, just to show you the encoding, uh, you can always add, you know, nine digits. Almost nobody has all 32 characters being used in their SSID, and uh, then we the encoding. It's open. You know, we want this to be some kind of a. Uh, a standard or something that you know we're, we'd like to find people that are interested in doing something with this. I talked to Roger Mike at Sun Labs, Sun Microsystems Labs, and they have these um, jo uh, sunspots they make, and he'd like to tag these with GeoFi tags so that when they send data out, they just include this nine-character code, and so then you've got the data tagged without you know the long lat long coordinates. So, um, anyways, we've got this website called GeoFi.net. It's still password protected, but we'll open up soon when we're done developing it. And this is a place where you can go to ask, where am I? Type your GeoFi code in or set up an access point. And I can show you that. As a matter of fact, it's easy enough to, to do. Uh, I go here to uh, add access point. And then you can type an address. Someone shout an address out. I don't know, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue.
Okay, so there's the president's geofence. In fact, you can drag this around and say, okay, his access point's right there in the Oval Office or something. So there's, there's his GFI code. So it's pretty easy uh, to, to generate the codes. And so viral aspect, I agree with that. We need to have something. So first of all, why don't we uh, uh, try to um, uh, boot. That's the word. <laughs> My brain is fried. Bootstrap it. Thank you. It's not bootstamp. Bootstrap. Uh, the disadvantage of this is that it is a grassroots effort, and someone could attack it by just putting in random codes. But there are ways to, to get around that. And this is a cooperative thing, so it's probably not a big deal. But you control your own SSID. It works indoors, works wherever you have an access point, and you don't need a map. And uh, so some people say, well, you have to boil the oceans, right? But actually, it turns out that it's, it's not impossible to boil a small part of the ocean, right? So we just need to boil a little bit at a time. So we could go to you know, Google Wi-Fi. I don't know if you guys have a Wi-Fi site like Google does. We could go to Mountain View. They already know where all their access points are in Mountain View, and they could just turn it on in a second, give everyone in Mountain View a, uh, you know, this kind of uh, information immediately. And of course, the nice thing is it works with any device that has Wi-Fi, and a lot more devices that has Wi-Fi now. We could go to Fawn Networks uh, out of Spain. They have 150,000 Wi-Fi access points all around the world. In fact, they did a deal with British Telecom. They have 3 million British Telecom users have broadband access, and many of those have Wi-Fi access points uh, that are supplied by British Telecom, so they could do a similar thing there. And then, uh, or, you know, Oklahoma City, many cities have municipal Wi-Fi networks. This is the, happens to be the largest one in the U.S., and they could easily turn it on there as well. So it wouldn't be too hard to get, you know, a campus, like Microsoft could do it, you know, or anybody could set up their own area, and then it would provide value for you, even if, and your neighbors, even if it didn't, um, you know, work everywhere you went in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be great if, sorry, you already saw this demo. I always have a movie backup, right, just in case the demo doesn't work. Uh, the, um, uh, it does require a human right now, but if we could convince uh, Cisco or somebody uh, in the registration process to offer you know, you go register, type in your address. It's an interesting thing is that you know, Microsoft's got thousands of them around here. Yeah. And uh, if you somehow selectively did a few of them, mm -hmm. then somehow all the others could. Oh, then they could fight, figure it out themselves. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it would be some big bundle adjustment thing to refine everybody. Yeah. So everybody could where they are. Yeah, you could do that. Stays in the ground. But surprisingly, most people have a map, just like the Google map I showed you a minute ago. They actually know where they are, so all they need to do is do the conversion, which is a you know, four-line Python script or Perl script or something, and do the conversion and then insert it in there. And Cisco and uh, other companies that manage large networks, I, I don't know who, who Microsoft uses, but there's a good chance that you have a management, network management app in here somewhere that basically, if you provided that functionality to the network management app, it could go and change the access point IDs, SSIDs, automatically, you know, kind of in one fell swoop. The disadvantage is now you get this list of all these access points. And uh, the, sta the standard is set up in such a way that if you have multiple access points with the same SSID, you can roam freely between them in certain circumstances. And, you know, if they have the same SSID and web password. But if we uh, use the second channel, almost all of these have between 2 and 16 uh, channels available. Not channels is the wrong word because that means something specific for Wi-Fi wi networks, but basically uh, separate access points, virtual access points. So we could easily use a second one and so that you can still be connected to the Microsoft main one or the Microsoft guest one, but then there's a few that are broadcasting these things and you can use them to triangulate yourself. So let's see, I mentioned the camera example already. Yeah, it'd be nice if we could get Starbucks to turn it on. You know, or I was, think, I was going to mention when people register their access points, we can just say, well, if you use this code, then you'll know where you are. And so, you know, I mean, how, how many people here have installed access points? I've installed like three in the last two years at my house. And there's a bunch of like Meraki networks where, like the Fawn Networks one, where you actually manage it online on a map. You say, this one's here, this one's there. So they know your location as long as you don't lie about it. And uh, so it's to your advantage to know. So um, anyways... Yeah. Oh, sorry, Paul. So, yeah. um, other than using it indoors, it's the advantage that you don't need a separate piece of technology to receive GPS. Well, so it, basically, it's a software upgrade to know where you are. 
uh, for anything that has Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Well, so resolution is a funny question. So the G the GeoFi access uh, values are about two and a half feet apart in Northern California. So of course, closer to the North Pole, they're going to be a little closer up here in one direction and the same distance in the other direction. So uh, the, the resolution of the node itself, you know, the position is fairly accurate. I could put four on this table easily up here, maybe six, I don't know. You know, so I have separate ones if I had that many, but of course you never put them that close together. Uh, we've experimented a little bit, and if you have enough around the perimeter and some inside, then you can get, you know, 10 feet accuracy. Certainly it's no worse than the access point range which is about 10 meters, right? Because if you can't hear the access point, then you don't think you're next to it, right? So it depends on how many you have and how well your triangulation algorithm works. But you're not going to, it doesn't really work to two or three feet. Mm -hmm. uh, I think around 30 feet. Yeah, you can usually hear them about 30 feet away. It depends also if you're in, you know, on the other side of a wall. Like you could. The guys have driven around. And oh, I don't know. It, do you know? Uh -huh. Well, iPhone takes this approach of giving you a circle and saying you're in the circle somewhere, right. right? So I've never seen the circle less than 30 or 40 feet wide, but often, you know, a quarter of a mile. And whether it's using Loki or the cell phone tower, yeah. Okay, we should probably move on, but Africa. But now you're losing me. So you're still using, you're still doing triangulation based on the visibility of. Right, like you're just taking the you just taking the war driving out and replacing it by a collaborative cooperative system. Yes. But you, but you could not be, like you couldn't be more accurate than like Place Lab or any of those. Right? Uh, anybody that does the war driving, uh, you can only be more accurate in places where they haven't driven. Right. That's all. Yeah. Well, no, yeah. you couldn't be. I mean, the fundamental. Uh, in fact, Ekhau is going to be the most precise because you walk around and measure the signal strength like in the four corners of the room and you walk down up and down the chairs or something and so then they know where you are you put on a map and it listens and then it does its best estimate I think I think it's best to look yeah. at this as telling you you're within range of a given access point because I think other than that uh, you know you're fooling yourself if you think it's going to be that accurate very often so we can do a little bit more if there's several around you with by relative signal strength, but it's not a very accurate uh, method. It's just a fun project, and uh, you know, if you have a use for it, let me know. I think Rico would like to just license it for free and try to build up some kind of community, set up a website, do some fun things with it. But it's not, um, it's not like one of these, like Joypo requires a lot of, you know, highfalutin technology. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a lot of thought, and this is just fun. Yeah. So, okay. So I wanted to mention um, RI Labs uh, briefly. It's a new activity started in January, and the goal is to provide access to um, RI technologies that uh, normally would just be published at CHI or something, and then nobody would ever necessarily see it again. Especially in this case, I want to talk about eye candy a minute, because eye candy, some of you have seen this already. It's a fun kind of a consumer application, but it doesn't really apply directly to things we're doing at um, Rico as a company. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with copiers and digital cameras so much. So um, so we'd like to you know, play around with it and let people try it out and kind of see what we can learn. Maybe it does apply to business in some way. We can learn from that. So this is uh, from a presentation that Jamie Graham gave in CHI 2008. Give you an overview of eye candy and then give you a demonstration. So um, you, you've heard of eye candy before. I don't need to tell you this. But this has to do with iTunes, the special interface for music and video on the internet. And uh, it uses the artwork that we're familiar with. You know, um, People used, well, I guess it goes over this in a minute. So uh, anyways, it, it's based on the artwork that we're used to seeing visually. And it works right now with iTunes and YouTube. And we use paper tokens. I have some examples up here of some of these paper tokens. And I've got some plastic credit card style tokens as well. And uh, it's, uh, it's very easy to use. And it's just a different way of interacting with your digital media. Digital media is becoming so ethereal now. It's kind of disappearing. It's just on your computer in a database, and so this gives you a different way of accessing it. So um, it, uh, you know, right now we access our media through some interface. I should put a zoom up here since I'm at Microsoft. But you know, we used to go through these albums, you know, look at the cover art, pull the record out, put it on a play. We don't do that anymore. And actually art is a very important part of the music industry since, uh, you know, almost a century ago. 
Um, in fact, recently it's become more popular uh, again with the iTunes cover flow, again, you know, moving away from the database, you know, table view, spreadsheet view to something more visual. And um, uh, so, you know, people, uh, when they come to a, or in fact, I read an interesting story uh, the other day that uh, a record company, or a, what do they call them now, a disc, you know, a place that sells music, accidentally ordered the vinyl version of an album. I thought, what the heck, and put it up on the, on the store, on the shelf, and they sold out pretty quickly. It was kind of funny because you think, who buys vinyl anymore? But um, you know, but people used to get these photos and books and everything, and even the CDs. You get the CD book. If you buy it from iTunes, they'll give you a PDF file. You know, oh well. So we're looking at tangible interfaces, and especially with uh, this part that came out of the shared records, tangible interface to documents. You know, we can do the same thing with photos and music and that brings uh, paper and digital things together in a way that's fun to use and fun to look at. And it's easy also. So um, we have these uh, pointing devices, or we call them digital cameras. I've got one in the front of my computer right here. We have one we made just for eye candy here. It's just a webcam and a different form factor you can set down on the barcodes. And you can use these to point at anything you're interested in in listening to or seeing, and it brings it up electronically. In fact, um, the nice thing about having the tangible things, the cards, is that you can just spread them out and, and sort them out or organize them. If you have a, a party at your house, you can just let people pick through them and choose one, I want to play this, add it to the playlist. So it's kind of more like the way people share things anyways. You know, you, you don't get people gathered around the computer screen so much, it's not nearly as much fun as passing cards around, let's listen to this next. You know, some examples of sharing, just handing a document to somebody else. See, I'm not sure. Like I said, I'm actually replaying someone else's slides, so forgive me if I don't know all the details. But one thing that's really interesting is I can give you a card, and if you own the music, it works just fine. But what happens if you don't own the music? Well, it turns out, since we're connected to the network, that we can ask you where you want to buy it from. So it's another way of sharing. I can give you cards. If I'm a band and I'm playing at a... Uh, some club, I can hand out cards with my music on it, and if it's free, it just downloads. If it's not free, then you can order it online. You can listen to a clip and then order it if you want to. And you might want to share you know, YouTube videos or something. So we have uh, ShareTube, which is these same cards with essentially something like a URL, and then it takes you right to the ShareTube, uh, the YouTube video. So I'm going to tell you about this print dialog in a minute um, after I give the demo. Actually, maybe I should just do the demo right now, and then we can get back to it. Switch over to Windows, and I've got a, um, basically I have my camera up here running, and so I can flip through a little book of songs. Let's say I want to hear uh, Day Dub's uh, Detour, Detour. I can just hold it up to the camera. Okay. And if I have one that I don't own, another form factor, just put them in a photo album. And here's uh, Goo Goo Dolls. And I, I don't have that one in my playlist, so... So it says you want to go to iTunes Store or Amazon to buy it. So let me just go to the iTunes Store. The fun thing is, inside this code is information about who printed it. So you can print these at home, or you can order them from Shutterfly. We've ordered Moo cards from Moo in England. Uh, we have an interface with Coop as well, so we can make these flip books from Coop. And uh, if I want to make a book of my favorite music, I can give it to you, Rico, and you can take it home and listen to it or whatever. These also can represent playlists as well, so you can have a bunch of songs that play in an order. So then I'll give, give you an example, YouTube video as well. Let's see. Oh, sorry, I have my finger over the barcode. So she goes right to the YouTube site. And pulls it up. In uh, the other thing I can do also, if I want to. Oops, wrong mouse. Second. Uh, and we've had a lot of fun with him over the years. So, uh, <laughs> so let's take a look back at some. He's funny. Uh, my business card has a barcode on the back. So if I want to load up my, um, if I give this card to someone and they want to load up my business card. 
it just downloads the vcard file. And it'll open up, uh, I don't remember what it opens up here. Let's see if we can find out. Outlook or something. For some reason, it doesn't show up here. But anyways, now I've got my business card in my contact list. I, for some reason, this one, it doesn't have an icon. Let's see. I think it shows up behind everything. Well, anyways. It does actually work. I don't know why it, why it didn't work in that case. So you can easily share data that way. You can share files. But it's kind of fun with the eye candy. You know, people like to look at the artwork. And it's nice just to be able to pass things around. And, and these things are cheap. You know, you can print out. Uh, we sometimes use those business card sheets and just print out, you know, 20 or 30 at a time. And then you can just give them to your friends. And, you know, here's the music I'm listening to. So similar to the way people, you know, will borrow an, ear, an earbud and listen to what you're listening to on your iPod. Well, here you go. So I, I kind of skipped over the print dialog, but basically uh, you can drag and drop things from your iTunes library into this print dialog, and then it'll, and you can say I want to print it at Coop, or I want to print it at um, um, uh, you know locally. So there's a number of output options, and then uh, also it's kind of fun. You can put these on the phone as well. So uh, you can be flipping through your videos and find, uh, I mean, your, your album, find it when you want to play, just hold it up to your computer. It'll start playing on the computer. So we started this several years ago, uh, something called Video Paper, which is looking at how you can skim video uh, while um, looking at it in a paper form. And I don't have the video to show you on this, but I can show you uh, basically what's going on is we would record TV content and index it, uh, do... Um, uh, also take the uh, closed captioning information. We'd create a piece of paper that had barcodes on it, the closed caption information, and, and individual frames. And so then with a remote that could read the barcodes, we would uh, be able to start on any video output device, uh, video starting at the point where you said you were interested. So you can actually read through the video and see if you want to find out more about it, then you can display it directly from the paper. So we had a number of different layouts we tried. Um, Timeline-based layouts or flipbook layouts. In fact, I think uh, Book with Voices, I think, came from uh, Scott Clemmer, who is at Stanford now. He was at uh, Berkeley at the time. He did this work, and he had been a summer student of ours before that. And then we had a multimedia newspaper we published in uh, Enrico Innovations for a number of weeks where we just got stuff off the web and uh, video, different video clips or things he'd recorded online, I mean, uh, from a TV. So I wanted to show you about the ease of use of eye candy. One, one thing that's appealing about eye candy is that everyone can understand how to use it. So I'd like to show you a little video uh, that I think proves that to be true. Uh, I can find it. So this is Jamie's uh, four and a half year old daughter. And she just loves, she made this book herself. He gave her all the cards and she put them in. And now whenever she wants to listen to something, she just goes and puts the, oh, the little the camera on. So, you know, you don't have to think about, oh, can I put the CD in? Is it going to get scratched? You just put it in there ready to go. So she really enjoys it. She's in charge of putting music on at their house now. Oh, it's B-52s. I have another video of her one and a half year old brother, and he's just kind of pounding on it and finally brings something up, and then he dances. I won't bother with that right now. So, anyways, we have a, a website we're putting up, and if you're interested, uh, this will be available on the internet um, soon through RI Labs. And so, if you're interested, I'll pass out these cards, and uh, it has a URL you can go to to find out more information and see a video of it in use. So, I have one other. Uh, are, we, are you still with me? Shall I stop while we're ahead? Or I have one other thing that's kind of interesting. So a couple of years ago, several years ago, we decided that um, electronic paper devices looked interesting. And you know, APD is nice for a couple of reasons. It's, it's very thin. You can make it flexible. You can, uh, you know, um, 
it's supposed to be cheap eventually. It's still fairly expensive, but it's supposed to be cheap. You know, and Sony's making a reader, and uh, there's a company in the Netherlands called IREX that makes uh, the Iliad, which is kind of a reader. And uh, you know, it looks like it might be pretty interesting. So we thought, well, let's play with it and see what we can do with it. And one of the frustrations with these EPD devices is it takes a half a second to a second to update the display. So you can't do any kind of animation. You can't even really write on them with a pen very easily because you, you, you draw the line for the T and then you go to cross the T and it's not there. And if you're watching, if you're not looking, it's fine. But if you're watching, it's going to bother you. You know, it's always lagging behind. So we thought, well, maybe there's a way we can improve the um, uh, pen tracking on a device like this, even though there's this limitation of um, uh, how fast it can update. So. Uh, Users want to read on devices. They also want to write. Uh, if you have a paper-like display, you want to use it like paper and take notes. But it has to update quickly so that it's usable. And the current device, even though the IREX provides some type of pen tracking, it, that requires a special controller that they developed there. In fact, uh, E-Ink, e working with Epson, just released a new controller uh, called uh, Broadsheet that will support the same type of pen tracking on their other devices as well. But so, but. You know, they already had a controller, but they didn't have pen tracking working on the controller. So we had a solution uh, based on software only. So I want to show you a comparison. Well, I should have those go one at a time, shouldn't I? Let me try that again. Maybe I can run them, run them one more time. So there's significant lag on the IREX device. And this is with our software. So this is the exact same type of ink you know, ink has made different types of ink. The display size is a little bit smaller, but you can see there's a much faster uh, update rate. Let's see here. Okay, what's going on? Oh. Mm -hmm. Let's do this again also. Go. Oh. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a performance difference, even though the ours is not based on hardware, it's based on software. And I can give you some background about why it's that way, if you'd like. But basically we created, we have a host controller, we have the metronome controller from Inc, which only supports essentially full page updates. It flashes a whole page at a time. Perhaps you've seen these readers, you go to the next page, it flashes at you, and it's kind of a little bit disturbing. I mean, you can, you know, you don't have to worry about it too much, but, but that means if you're drawing and you use that controller, you know, it's flashing at you, you don't want to, you know, it's, and even if you do the direct update, which doesn't flash, there's still a significant delay. So, um, like I said, there's a uh, sometimes a half second, millisecond latency updating pen tracking in their normal mode of use. And we have only a 20 to 40 millisecond latency in our system. And the way it works is, um, as the uh, as you touch your pen, uh, you know the information is sent to the controller to update the display. So not when you touch it the first time, but after a certain period of time when you've touched it a second time then information is sent to the controller and, uh, and it starts drawing. But uh, when you touch it the third time, or when you, you know, continue drawing, we're already updating the, the next segment, whereas ink has to wait until this segment's completely updated before they can even start on the next segment. So we're already finished with this one and part into this one, and they haven't even started the next one. So that's uh, another thing that's a little bit disconcerting, even if you're not doing the flashing. So the reason, one of the reasons is that um, the way they drive the displays, they have a 20 millisecond clock, and they can only change how it's displayed, uh, you know, what's being displayed based on this uh, 20, 20 millisecond uh, sampling rate. So this is also the touchscreen sampling rate, but it, it corresponds to the pen tracking timing. So what happens is, uh, if you're using the regular e-ink display, you can dis display one line, and you have to wait till the end of that line to display the next line. And we managed to make it so that you can overlap it. Uh, this way, after 20 milliseconds, we can start working on the next line immediately. And uh, we do that by updating the frame buffer um, regularly every 20 milliseconds and using the controller in a separate mode. Usually the controller says, give me the new page, tell me to start, and I'll let you know when I'm done. You can't change anything. But we kind of twisted that around. And we said, here's the new page, but we secretly changed the page while it's not looking. And so it's uh, updating as if. Uh, um, it's, happily, it's happy to update it the way we want using software. In fact, what we do is um, we use their image frame buffer and, uh, let's see, 
Let's see if I can explain this a different way. So the E controller works by looking at the old image and the new image, creating a lookup table based on those two images, and then um, it applies a voltage uh, waveform, and the voltage waveform comes from um, a, a waveform buffer. And so it applies that voltage waveform based on the lookup table in here. So a waveform might look like this in, in any case, but there's a variety of waveforms they use in order to get the best quality. So what we do instead is we drive the lookup table to create the waveform, and we use waveforms that are just a single flat line, one up, one down, and we just you, you know, switch which waveform we're using dynamically as it goes. So that, the pen tracking waveforms like this are just flat, and they look uninteresting, but we do all the interesting stuff in the frame buffer dynamically. And uh, so if we get a pixel update, then we tell it start updating, and then when we're done, we tell it stop updating in the frame buffer instead of doing it through the waveform. Does that make sense? Okay. One of the advantages of not watching this remotely on the computer is you can ask me questions directly. <laughs> we also have a similar broadcast system at Rico. So every once in a while, you've got a lot of work to do, but you have a little window open here. So, so anyways. Uh, so the performance, um, oops, I skipped over that. So you can see here, these pictures are taken at the same, uh, these are the same distance. I mean, um, basically there's the, the difference where before when, when it starts to show up when you're drawing on the IREX compared to it shows up almost immediately on ours, much shorter distance and it gets darker a little quicker as well. So if we measure that in time, it's 200 milliseconds between point A and point B. Even though the distance doesn't look that big of a difference, the time is actually significantly different. And so right now, we just do it independently for every uh, drawn pixel. But the nice thing is it is software, so it works with existing controllers and existing systems. And we might uh, extend it to a grayscale it's just, instead of just black and white. But this is an interesting um, project for us because it enables, uh, if we want to create a device, uh, devices that allow you to read and write, this is usable writing, where the stuff that's out there now is barely usable. This is actually feels good. When you, when you give both devices to people to try it out, uh, they immediately want to reject the one. I mean, we haven't done any user studies, like detailed user studies, but it's very clear to people who have used it. So I have one more set of slides if you want, but I think um, we can call it done and say thank you. But if anyone's interested, you can... Welcome. I'm happy to uh, take questions or let you play with the demos or anything. Okay. Thank you very much.